Well, this is week five of our political podcast, our Peacemaker podcast during the election season. So this is five of uh, seven. So after this, is only two more. Um, this is going to be a panel. You're going to see a panel here of people. These last three are meant to be panel discussions about specific topics, jumping around. Uh, this this Tonight, we, we see a, a discussion around, uh, number one, how the current administration handled uh, the corona covid pandemic crisis. Uh, we're going to talk about abortion, number two. And number three, we talk about uh, socioeconomic structures like welfare and, and, and universal health care uh, for those who uh, are, are uh, lower on the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, this is only men. And that's not by choice. That's not by planning. I tried to get some women in on this. I Trust me, I did. Uh, but it didn't work out. It didn't work out. However, the last panel is going to be women. We've got women confirmed for that. We haven't recorded it yet, so you never know, but we've got a few women confirmed for that. So the last episode of this will be a group of women. In between there, there's supposed to be one more episode in between those two, and uh, that one, not quite sure. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I want to let you guys know, if you guys have an opinion about something, if somebody says something that kind of ticks you off, and you're like, wait a second, there's another side to that coin, let me know. I'll stick you on here. You can be on here. In fact, some people who have expressed opinions or probably problems with stuff people said, I think I've always invited, hey, you want to come on here, you want to share? Um, I understand the hesitancy, believe me, I understand the hesitancy for why folks don't want to come on and, and, and talk about stuff. I, I, I totally get it. Looking ahead, after this political season, election season series ends, looking ahead, well, we're going to do one on technology and how families handle technology, uh, how individuals handle technology, um, your kids, what you do with your kids, and then looking further ahead, um, probably in the beginning of 2021, the next series after that, thinking it's going to be justice issues, specifically justice issues, uh, some of which came up during this political season series, um, but we only touched on them as they related to politics and, and the election. Um, but we can talk about them. We can talk about every justice issue uh, from different angles, not just polit politically, uh, but also historically, um, sociologically, um, and, and ju just individually. What are you doing? And, and we can dive into those in more depth. What's our church doing? So that's kind of a just, just a little look. We're doing series by series. Uh, so if you're out there and you're thinking, hey, I would love to talk about family and, and, and technology, and I'll tell you some practices I do with my kids, I'd love to hear it. Uh, we want to start scheduling those. We're going to probably take a few weeks off in November and then do a few towards the end of the year uh, for that. Okay. Um, enjoy today. This is a few guys from our church. Frank Martinez, Mike Francis, Nick Carlson, Jack Timmerman, and of course, Tom Sargent helps me moderate. Enjoy. Oh, Tom, uh, you want to just jump into it? We can have each of you guys. We, we, Tom and I figured we'd start by having each of you guys kind of just identify if you have a label for yourself, if you call yourself a liberal or a conservative, Republican or Democrat, I know Frank, for instance, said last week, I don't call myself a Republican, I call myself a conservative. Um, so whatever, whatever it is, you know, you're like, you know, what, I'm a moderate this, just to, uh, just to help sh showcase somewhat of a diversity here. Um, you can say who you voted for, whatever. Um, and then Tom, we'll, we'll just kind of go from there. Yeah, I think that sounds good. I think it's a good way to kick it off. Go ahead, Frank. What's up, guys? My name is Frank. Uh, I consider myself, well, I am a conservative, uh, but my title is more of a Christian conservative. You know, I don't, you know, I, I, I want to premise that by saying I am a Christian first. So uh, so I'm a Christian conservative. I, I vote mostly uh, Republicans because they stand on what I believe in. Uh, but I will... I, I would, I would uh, uh, vote for Democrat if they, if they, if I hear something that, that I, I particularly, uh, that that, that helps me, you know, what I, what I want to see in, in my, in my politics. That's it. All right. Thank you, Frank. Who's next, Jack? Yeah. I'm. Um, Moderate conservative is the way I'll say it. I am not as far right leaning as uh, as my wife thinks I am, <laughs> uh, but I'm certainly more right than left uh, on almost every issue, um, and uh, have been that way for most of my adult life. Uh, I, I've rather uh, evolved over the years. Uh, my first presidential election, 
I voted for Eugene McCarthy because even, um, gosh, now I can't think of his name, the Democratic candidate wasn't liberal enough for me. So, uh, but that, that changed as I started getting paychecks and watching my tax dollars at work. Were you a Reagan, Reagan guy, Jack? Pretty much a Reagan Republican. I kind of, and I would probably tell you of, of our recent presidents, he's the one I probably identify most with in, in terms of my political leanings. Nick? Um, I consider myself, uh, I'd probably consider myself left as opposed to liberal, which is, I guess, I mean, there's no good unified definition, but I would say it's just um, uh, liberal carries a lot of baggage that I don't like. Um, you know, I've heard people uh, say that basically, you know, a liberal is someone who will do a lot of the things that, you know, um, they don't like, but they'll do it with a rainbow flag sticker. <laughs> so there's a lot of just kind of like symbolic wokeness type stuff that I don't really care for with liberals. So I just, I, I, I call myself left because I think that the most important issues are kind of socioeconomic and structural and that's kind of just a, a left-right thing and, and a lot of the cultural issues are are um you know can swing either way on that um depending on the era so i think the fundamental issues politically speaking is like socioeconomic stuff and i would be to the left um yeah I, um i was a uh, very conservative up until my early 20s, probably like mid late college, and then I kind of started uh, moving moving to the left pretty consistently throughout my 20s and 30s. All right, I'm a Christian first, like Frank. I'm a definitely conservative. I I was in it was about in my 30s in the 80s that I really really started getting involved in, uh, I became a political junkie. It's, and I, I, I loved Reagan. We'll get into this later, but what, what really got me was, was when Reagan uh, put Robert Bork on the Supreme Court and what happened to him. Can you give a brief summary if people don't remember the, um, the Senate confirmation hearings for Robert Bork? Yeah, I know, you, <laughs> people, people nowadays hear about being Borked, but yeah. back then, and it was Ted Kennedy, who was the leader, Robert Bork was brilliant. He was a Christian and he was pro-life. And that, Ted Kennedy, and there was a guy behind Ted Kennedy who was right there with him, who was his partner in crime. And that was good old Joe Biden. And they had to destroy Robert Bork because they wanted, they didn't want him, they, they didn't want him on because they were afraid that he would overturn. He was he was a brilliant man. Everyone said he was a brilliant man. He went. He was a Yale professor. He went on to. They went on to destroy. I mean, you talk about bearing false false witness, destroying someone. That's what they did to Robert Bork, and that's when I realized, man, these people are these people. Are, this is a horrible thing what they're doing. I agree that some people made a deal, obviously, about the abortion issue, but. Robert Bork also supported poll taxes um, for black voters in the South in his confirmation hearings. I think it's fair that those types of ethical uh, issues disqualify yeah, you know, yeah. For, for those who don't know what the poll tax was, <clears throat> can you kind of explain it? It's that you can put uh, that to sign up either to register to, um, to register to vote or to vote yourself. Um, there are the poll tax itself is that you have to pay a, you know, a fee for it, you know, whatever, 15 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with having to, you know, answer certain questions as well. Um, it was used for, you know, between the Civil War and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. It was used basically because Black people in the South had less money and less education. It was a way to weed out black voters um, without actually being upfront racist because you could say, oh, we didn't let this person vote because they didn't have the money or they didn't answer the question correctly, not because they were black. And obviously it would be 90% of the people turned away would be black because they're the ones who didn't have the money or the education. Um, and Robert Bork uh, voiced support for that and said it was not necessarily unconstitutional at his hearings, which um, in my view makes you unfit for the Supreme Court 
regardless of anything else. So I, I didn't have an issue with, with him being uh, worked um, on that basis uh, myself. Well, Jack, you had, you, you, you had told me you had voted f for Trump. You, you had told me that you, you voted for Trump in 2016, and now you're not sure if you're going to vote at all in 2020. Is that correct? Uh, well, I, I will vote in, in, in 2020. I may or may not cast a ballot for president. Okay. Uh, I, I, I know that sounds almost cowardly, and, and I am really trying to rethink that because I don't like the idea, even how it sounds. But uh, I, I rest that on um, what I regard as his mishandling, lack of, of handling on the whole COVID situation. Uh, we've had no unified um, national program. I believe we could have wrapped our arms around this much better, much more quickly, and put it to bed by now, or pretty close to putting it to bed. And instead, we had 50 states with 50 different policies, and uh, uh, he just he just really disappointed me with regards to his handling of, of COVID-19. And I, it, I can't get over that right now. Can, so. you be, can you be more specific? Well, you know, it, one of the things that seems pretty clear to me is that the wearing of masks has a profound impact on the spreading of, of the illness. Uh, and yet he poo-pooed the idea, refusing to do it himself, uh, uh, even the revelations, you know, and I certainly wish him to, to rapid health recovery after his own bout, but it's, it's now come out that, that nobody in the White House pays any attention and that he probably knew he was infected when he went to these rallies and, and et cetera. And I just find that deplorable. Uh, so it's uh, how, can, how can a leader of a nation not have his finger on the pulse when it comes to the science behind this this particular matter. Uh, I don't think he's been a god awful president. Uh, I, I think if he wouldn't tweet so often, if his thumbs were somehow paralyzed, I think most of us would have a different opinion of him. Uh, but you know, it's the it's the COVID nineteen situation that has really soured me on on wanting it to continue because I don't see any change coming in the policy then. Jack, in your opinion, what do you think is the motivation behind the way he approaches it? I think he's, um, he's so focused on the economy. Uh, yes, we want the nation to remain open. We want businesses to move forward. Um, and so he did not want to do things that would curtail economic growth. Um, and I think it would have been better had we shut down, frankly, uh, almost completely in April. Um, but I don't know, Tom, it's, it's what can I tell you? It, 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 I, I don't think he has a, a, an understanding of the, even after his own illness, I don't think he has an understanding of the problem. I just don't. Um, I think his ego's in the way, I think is what it is. Does anyone think, else want to chime in on what Jack said? Yeah. Trump, there was like 12 cases when Trump stopped the, the, coming from China, Wuhan, China. He, he stopped, stopped them from coming. Now, of course, he was called a xenophobe. And of course, there was Democrats who were saying, because Trump said that, they went against him, the opposite. Nancy Pelosi was telling people to go to parades, do this, go to cinemas. Uh, the bars, everybody was saying, go to do this, do this, because Trump said that. Uh, I, I think he listened to the science and he shut things out. And by the way, Fauci, in the beginning, said masks were ridiculous. And <laughs> so Fauci, the head of the CDC, he said masks were ridiculous, and then he changed. So every, everyone changed, uh, you know, a million times with this COVID. And what are we going to do about it? We, I think eventually everyone's going to get it, and, 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 and everyone's going to get better from it. 
999 and nine tenths out of a thousand are going to get better. So it's, it's, you know, whatever. Nick or Frank? No. The only thing I, I mean, I don't have, I plead ignorance on a lot of the, the COVID thing. Um, the, the only, the only, I guess, uh, thing I would have to say in response, um, uh, to what Mike said was, I'm, I'm not, unless I'm wrong, having a few cases in this country already um, being spread person to person through the country is a much bigger cause of the spread than people coming across through China. Like, I guess it seems that closing the borders to being like, oh, we're not going to have one or 2,000 people may come over who have it. But if it's already here and you shut the borders, but don't you know, put in place uh, aspects to stop the spread that's already here, that's going to cause a lot more than, than it would have been if you had left the borders open but stopped the spread within the country. At least that's what it seems to me. I think that's what the, pe the issue is. Nick, is that, is that an either or proposition? No, not neither or. Just the, the fact, though, that, it, that, that, that you know, Trump or, or Pence in the debate could defend the, the administration's response by saying we shut the border down is kind of like, um, you know, oh, we shut the, you know, we shut the barn door after the horse was out, but didn't do anything to actually go rescue the horse. <laughs> we let the horse run wild. Okay. Can, um, I re can, can I say something about that? Hold on, hold on. Let, let Nick finish and we'll see if Frank's got I'm something. Not, that's all I had to say. Frank, anything? Uh, yeah, I, I got something to say. Uh, first of all, we have the, uh, the uh, opportunity to have, uh, to have uh, hindsight because I don't care who you are and you know where you are in in this world when a pandemic comes who knows what's what it's going to be like you know what i mean and when the pandemic came i think the democratic party was so busy trying to impeach trump that nobody actually even said anything about it mm. you know what i mean until it was too late and then when it, when it, when when they were so so involved in trying to impeach this guy so when he shut down the borders, you know what they said? They said he did that so he can deflect from, the, from, from, from being impeached. So what happened was that instead of our Democrat, instead of our, our politicians coming together to try to fight this pandemic like they did, the Republicans came aboard when Obama had to deal with, with whatever, the, I think it was the, uh, the swine flu. I, I, Flying flying flu, flu, the flu, that 600 million, I mean, uh, 600, 6 million people got or something like that? or it was like 60 million. 60 million people got in the United States. And, and if it wasn't for it, if it was, if it was as bad as the, as the COVID, more people would have died and they botched that. You know, but nobody, nobody, nobody ever looks at that. You know why? Because they're so busy uh, thinking about what happened in, in, in uh, 2016 and trying to re reverse that instead of looking at what's going on right now. You know what I mean? It, it, you know, it's just, it, it, it's amazing to me how, you know, it's always Trump's fault when stuff happens, but when, when he's trying to put the, 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 the country together, like everybody wants to say, oh, he's, he's this, he's that, he's that. You know, he didn't become a racist until he ran for, yeah. for, for president. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's the amazing thing to me. Mm -hmm. He became a racist as soon as he came down the escalator. Because before that, you know what he had, he got tro he got awards from the NC, the uh, the NAACP. Yeah, you know he, was I mean? he, he was. I mean, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, all the rappers were like, "Be like Trump. Go hang in Margo Mar a Lago. Hang out with him. He's the he's the man. He's the this. He's the that." And all of a sudden, he became a racist just overnight. He was he was Oprah's favorite too. Yes, he was Oprah's and, favorite guest. <laughs> and the thing is that what 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 kills me is that. I've never, I've never had a president that's actually made promises that he kept. Yeah. Never. Even Reagan, the one I love, he couldn't even keep it. You know why? Because he had a Democratic House and he had, a, he yeah, had yeah. to deal with a Democratic Senate as well. You know what I mean? And, and the bottom line is, is that this guy's economy was booming so much and he shut it down because of the COVID. And listen, in my business, I've never made that much money. Hmm. And then all of a sudden I made that, and you know what? It got shut down just like that. You know why? Because of the COVID. Because he listened to the science. But the question that I had, and it's, it's to Jack, but it can be you know, to everybody else, 
it's sort of about the, the take that people have on COVID and how it's being handled. So it's sort of a two part you know, question here. One, the first part, just think about um, how many deaths would there have been if somebody else was president? Uh, and two, how do you know? Well, probably impossible to answer uh, to a certain degree, but um, I believe that had we had a unified plan, number one, no matter what that was, we would have been more effective in, in fighting the pandemic. We, we really can't allow uh, something that affects the entire nation like COVID-19 to be handled individually. Uh, that, just, that just allows the inconsistencies uh, from one to another uh, to grow. Uh, you know, you, you could wear a mask in New Jersey and, and uh, you know, when you get down to South Carolina, no one's wearing them and, and, and you get sick, uh, th those kinds of things. Uh, so um, I believe that there would have been presidents that would have handled it better and contained it better. And I, there are presidents, as, as Mike had mentioned, who, you know, uh, uh, would probably have uh, not done anything uh, along those lines, at least not right away. And it would have been a, a, worsening, situ a worsening situation. So, um, gosh, I, I guess if, if any of us here had the, the answer to that question, uh, you know, we probably wouldn't have be having the conversation, right? Uh, but it's a, it, it's a tough thing. Yeah, and that's a good take on it. The purpose of the question was to sort of point out how these things are, are, are somewhat unknowable. Sure. Yeah, right. Um, however, it seems like the response from people is that it is as though it is knowable. So it's where does that certainty come from on either side of that it would have been better or worse that he's doing, you know, a great job in preventing as many deaths as he can, or he's doing a terrible job in bungling it and 10 times as many people have died as, as have should. So why do you think people address that topic with such certainty when there's really no certainty to be had? Anybody can answer that. I think that plays into politics. Yeah. I think there's such vitriol in the nation right now. You know, I, I asked my son the, the other day, I said, where, where are the statesmen? Where are the people who, who regularly would reach across the aisle and do what's right for America? We don't seem to have too many of them in, in, in this particular time. Uh, if you're pro-Trump, you know, you are necessarily anti-Pelosi and, and vice versa. And that's not helping anything. So it, it really doesn't matter which side takes an initiative. The other side's going to condemn it. And I'm not sure we'd even recognize the best way to do things anymore uh, because of the politics behind it. Jack, can I ask a, a quick follow-up to you? Um, sure. You said you might not vote for president. So it, like, why would you not vote for, why is Biden just out of the question? Um, it's hard for me to endorse what I regard as liberal economic policies. Uh, I don't like the way the Democrats seem to want to spend my taxes uh, an awful lot uh, on, on giveaways. Uh, and uh, it, it would be hard for me to, to overcome that. Um, it, it's really, it was, the, it was the tax and the, the, the sorts of attitudes uh, in, in the 70s, you know, that, uh, that I, I, I did like uh, or endorse. And, and again, as I, as I grew and I saw that these programs were very ineffective, we're just throwing money at problems without educating people, without helping them develop. Um, so that, I don't know, I'm getting off track here. So no, no, I, I was curious. I was curious. It's, it's hard for me to, to see, uh, you know, we have five generation, we're in our fifth generation of handouts in this nation and maybe sixth generation. And what has it bought us? What has it got for us? Um, so, I don't know, I don't like that. Tom, didn't, didn't mean to derail you. I, I feel like the pros and cons of the welfare state could be revisited if we have- I was just gonna uh, suggest the same thing. That's a good segue into our 
second section of the evening, which would be, <laughs> as I texted you guys out, sort of these topics where I think that anybody but Christians in particular could struggle over or differ on the, the need for compassion versus stewardship and responsibility as it applies to certain uh, issues. And one of those, I think, is welfare and other uh, similar social uh, programs that Jack had just mentioned, uh, which have existed in our country for a while. And um, I just wanted to uh, get people's opinions on that because I, I, it's one thing that I, I struggle, you know, with sort of in a way reconciling our call to be compassionate, to help, you know, the, the poor, the less fortunate, you know, that's a Christ centered um, view, I think. Uh, however, as Jack was mentioning, throwing money at the problem, you know, hasn't seemed to do much in his opinion. So I want to kind of go around uh, the room and see where everybody falls on the do we think that we're really being effective with our welfare programs in America? And if you don't, how do you juggle that with the Christ-like desire to help those less fortunate? And Chris, you can tweak the question if you like. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Nick, Nick, this is where you lean left, and this is a big reason why you lean left, correct? Uh, I mean, not welfare not welfare but specifically but in general the um yeah the uh uh more much more um public uh you know public solutions to uh to the socioeconomic issues rather than purely private ones i guess would be the way i put it so can you elaborate on what you see as the what has worked well or or what you think needs to be implemented more so uh, I mean, my, uh, the biggest thing I think would be to, um, my biggest goal politically in terms of what I would like to see for the country would be to give, put everyone on as um, kind of a, as equal a, a, uh, a footing uh, and as equal of a starting ground to be able to pursue their own interests to pursue the you know the life liberty and the pursuit of happiness as it says in the declaration of independence um which uh i don't think just apply i don't think that is just done by having you know everyone is under the same rules under the same law because it's like in a sporting game you know if you had two football teams and they have the you know the same the same rules it's it's 10 yards for a first down for both teams it's, uh, you know, they have to, uh, you know, make it 100 yards to, to, from one end of the field to the other. The rules are the same, you know, but one team, you give them the first 15 picks in the draft, and then the other team gets the 16th pick. Obviously, the rules are the same, but one team is starting off from a much higher level and is going to almost certainly annihilate the other team. And I feel like, um, you know, obviously people aren't going to be equal in terms of their abilities and how much success they have, how much money they earn, stuff like that. But uh, I think it's true that um, people start off their life uh, with much, much different, um, uh, much different situations. Um, you know, some people start off with uh, millions of dollars from the time they're born. Some people start off with a, just a solid middle class family. Some people start off with absolutely nothing and i feel like that is something that um in the vast majority of cases uh follows through people's entire lives in terms of health outcomes access to medicine access to education which in turn you know affects incomes down the line and it, it, I, I think society in a lot of ways now is the equivalent of uh you know a, a national football league in which some of the teams basically can spend a hundred million dollars and get all the draft picks and other teams basically are just, you know, hiring high school football players to be there, their teams and expecting them to compete. Um, so in aspects uh, that are kind of fundamental, I think, to um, allowing people to have a, a solid foundation for success, you know, the basics like education, uh, healthcare, and, you know, food in your stomachs um, each day, I am very pro, um, you know, strongly taking action to to level those aspects as much as possible, 
uh, I, I just feel it's kind of a, a joke to say, oh, everyone has equal opportunity and can make their, you know, have personal responsibility to live their own life when you're starting out from such different places. Um, obviously, certain people can do it, but uh, it's, it's going to be a very, um, a very incompetent person who is born with millions of dollars and ends up becoming a complete failure in life. And it's going to be an extremely amazing person who has nothing, nothing and rises to the top level. Like, that's something that can happen, but it, it, it usually doesn't. Um, so I think that uh, flattening those advantages and disadvantages out um, so that if someone becomes a success, it's because they worked hard and they're talented, not because they, you know, were able to go to a good college because their parents had money, whereas someone who's smarter and harder working never goes to college because they're working at McDonald's, um, you know, until they're free. Nick, Nick to, to summarize that, would you say that you're generally in favor of higher degrees of uh, government um, related wealth redistribution um, for the sake of those programs? Just just to sort of blanket. Um, yes, just to start. Yeah, I, large I, view on it. I violated the, uh, the, uh, the rule against rambling, but so I apologize <laughs> on that if, I, if need be. No, I, I just wanted to make this point specifically just to try to streamline it, yeah. Yes, I would, um, I, yeah, I, I I think taxation and wealth redistri redistribution through taxation in order to have a, a, a base level. Um, and then at that point, I'm fine with someone earning millions of dollars or whatever, or, 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 or being more successful. I don't think anyone has to have equal outcomes, but I think uh, whatever is required to kind of flatten the, 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 the floor and the ceiling um, so that the, um, you know, there's a, um, I guess a smaller disparity there. Okay. Thank you. So if, if anyone wanted to respond to Nick, that that's totally fine, but you can also sort of weigh in on your opinions on the way America handles, sort of handles taking care of the uh, underprivileged through our, our government um, means and whether or not you think that's been effective or you think it's been helpful. Um, since it's being reinstituted, and if you support more of that, or if you would prefer to attack that problem in a, a different way, and just for some numbers to put on that, um, including Medicaid costs, our country spends about a trillion dollars a year on welfare programs, which is a huge chunk of our overall uh, national budget. We've been doing some version of that for several decades, as Jack mentioned, and um, just want to get your opinion. Whether you think that's actually benefited people that it's meant to benefit, and if that's if your Christian values urge you to go more in that direction or in a different direction. And uh, anybody but Nick who wants to chime in, because yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I'll take uh, I'll take that. Uh, uh, when the uh, welfare, you see, welfare, I mean, welfare could be good if you're there for a second and you really utilize it the way it's, it should be utilized, not thinking that that's the end all and where, um, you know, this is what I'm going to count on for the rest of my life and my, uh, my kids are going to learn how to get on it and their kids are going to learn how to get on it and everybody else along the line is going to get on it. But if you just say, God forbid, lose a spouse or you lose a loved one and you're in you know, dire need and you need welfare, you know what, then I, and I support that. I think uh, giving money away with no strings attached or nothing to like have an incentive to get off is a, is a recipe for disaster. And, you know, and I think and I truly believe that as a human being, I think we all want to pay our own way. I mean, I think we all want to like say, you know, I mean, if you look at, look at somebody dead in their face and you ask them, well, if I can give you a hundred million dollars or you, I can learn, I can teach you how to make it. I think a lot of them would say, hey, let's teach me how to make it. You know what I mean? Um, I think in our schools and, you know, our schools, I mean, they, they should be open to anybody. I mean, we should, our ki the money should follow our children, not the other way around, you know? You know, if our child, 
if, if our child is smart enough, because he, he said something about schools, if our child is smart enough, they should be able to go into private schools and get a better education. You know what I mean? Teachers should be able to take care of schools, not administrators where they just, you know, the tax dollar doesn't get to this classroom. It stays, you know, in, inside the, uh, in the administrative, in the administrative part because of, you know, because of, you know, the, the money that they're, they're actually creating, you know, I, I, you know, you see it all the time, you know, mismanagement of money. I mean, I don't think we have a money problem in this country, man. We have a spending problem, you know, there's a spending problem, you know? No, and, Frank, let me just, let me jump in there real quick. Um, just to, so I understand the argument against welfare and how it kind of stifles the, the motivation to, to work. And once you get stuck in, you know, when, once you're in there, Frank, you talked about that last week, um, mm -hmm. about your, your, your cousin who got stuck in, in it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I understand that. But the outside of how are we going to pay for it, what's the argument against universal health care? Um, outside of how are we going to pay for it? Is there any principles that's like, no, we shouldn't provide health care for everybody? Or those of you who are consider yourselves conservatives, are you like, no, I would love to provide health care. I just don't know how to pay for it. Or do you have a, another kind of argument against it, like, like, like you may with welfare, um, which incentivizes fatherlessness or incentivizes you know, a, a lack of desire to work? You know what I'm asking? Right. I, don't, I don't see how universal health care would make somebody go, wow, well, I'm going to coast then. Right. Well, I mean, I think I think Tom ha handled that last week very well, and he said there was three there was three there was three parts to that, right? It's well, that was you're gonna, how you're you gonna get for it. You, you're gonna get, but you, if you're gonna give everybody in universal health care, is it gonna be quality? Because what happens is that it could be quantity but not quality. So you can it, it could be everybody gets it, but I mean, are you gonna be able to get what you need when you have when you need it? Because not or, or are you gonna have the the people that are actually doctors like Tom, are you gonna have people smart, like, you know, are gonna become doctors because they know, well, now I'm not gonna make as much money and I'm not gonna get into that field because I'm gonna spend all this money on getting education and I'm not gonna be able to pay for that. So now I'm gonna be stuck on, you know, making maybe $100,000 a year. But, but I mean, if I go into this other financial field, I can make more money. And then what happens is that we lose that. I mean, there's really no way. I mean, I think, I think, you know, how, how it is when people need help and, 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 and they get, they get the help they need. Right. And then with their employment, they actually, they create a, 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 a they, they have health care through their employments. You know, I mean, if we could all have the same health care that our politicians have for life, I'd sign up for that. You know what I mean? That's the one I'd sign up for. But there's no way that you that we're all going to get there. If we get universal health care, it's not going to be good enough. You know, grandma, when she needs, you know, like just say if she's 90 years old, what 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 value does she have? Oh, just give her this pill. Don't worry about it. She don't need the hip replacement. You know, when grandpa when grandpa gets to the certain age, because that's what's going to happen. Because now government is going to be tell you exactly how exactly who can get and who can't. Because it's not going to be a doctor that's going to make that decision. It's going to be a bureaucrat. Because now they get the money. So I'd like to give a chance for other guys to jump okay, in. Go ahead, go. I'm sorry, man. I, you got me going, man. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I uh, when when I retired from work, my I retired and I had I had my uh, medical. That was how I retired early, and my wife was on my was was with me, and it was okay. And then. Obamacare came and my, my union, my the company said, we can, it was too much. We, we, your wife isn't gonna have uh, uh, medical care no more. So that, that's gonna be too much because Obamacare, they're taxing us too much to pay for Obamacare. To pay for the people who don't have insurance, you know, they had to tax the good insurance company. So anyway, so anyway, they threw my, my wife had to leave had to leave because it was because of Obamacare. Now, now I had a now, I was forced to get Obamacare because because of the mandate. So I had to get Obamacare for her. And then we realized it's too expensive. But we're we're living on a fixed income. That's too expensive. Plus, I it was a 500 deductible. It went from 500 deductible to 5,000 deductible. So it was like it's so stupid. This is the stupidest healthcare. Jack? 
Healthcare is um, obviously it's a very important necessity in life. Uh, in this country, we, we have no one can be turned away from a hospital for an emergency requirement. Uh, Mike just spoke of the cost of Obamacare. Um, you know, I'm investigating healthcare costs as well. I'm on Medicare now at my age, and that's the best healthcare I ever had. Uh, but uh, it's if you go online and you start to research some of the costs for healthcare, you know, you could just you could just arbitrarily put in what your your income is, and if you say it's it's this, you're going to pay that. Uh, and so if you go in and say, well, gosh, my family income is only $10,000 a year, it's almost free to get health care. You put another zero on the end of that, and you're looking at $1,600, $1,800 for two people. Uh, and, and that becomes a, a formidable expense unless you're really, really independently wealthy. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's structured very well. Um, and, and the attempt to make sure that everybody is, has, has health care coverage is, is honorable, but not in the way we've, we've addressed it. Um, Tom did speak very eloquently last week on his interview about the costs and those you know, the three points. You can have quality, you can't, you can't have quality, though, at, at a low cost and things like that. Most of the people in Canada, people point to Canada and say they have universal health care. Most of the people in Canada who can afford to come to the United States for health care do. Um, it, it's, it's, they, they come for surgeries. They come for things that are not as well provided in Canada. Yeah, they have a, a, what seems to be a better system for the, the run of the mill, if you will. Um, you get a cold in Canada, you get taken care of. But you need heart surgery, you better have you better have a ticket to Chicago uh, or or New York or or somewhere, and they do. So it's not perfect by any means. Uh, um, that's it. Okay, Nick. Nick, it was your uh, give you last last kind of thoughts on that. Uh, I, I guess my two things would be number one. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, not being able to provide uh, better coverage, because you're going to get worse coverage. Um, as, as far as I can see, it seems that it's, that more of the countries that have the national health care have higher uh, um, life expectancies and better medical outcomes in general. So I don't know why that is if you can't, um, you know, it doesn't help. I don't think the fact that you, if you need a special surgery, obviously you can go um, spend whatever money you want on it, but having a base level of preventative care, um, you know, for people who are just are like, well, I'm not going to go for a checkup because I can't afford it. And then who knows what develops um, in you that's going to be a major disaster in five years, even though it's not in the meantime. I, I think those, uh, those healthcare outcomes in other countries speak for themselves. And then as far as Obamacare, I agree, it's terrible. Um, and uh, Obamacare was first proposed by the Conservative Heritage Foundation in the 70s and first implemented by Republican Governor Mitt Romney, it's explicitly a uh, free market solution to healthcare. And part of the reason why I don't think healthcare should be based on a free market, it should be more like the military where it's a, a government system because lives are at stake. Um, so uh, I agree, Obamacare uh, is bad because it's utilizes pure free market principles to uh, allocate health care. Hmm. Okay, so you all agree Obamacare doesn't work. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> um, Tom, should we try to uh, dive into the one, one more? Yeah. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and set it up? So, yeah, abortion. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, make this the last one. Um, I want to talk about the results. None, I, I believe nobody on here wants to see babies killed, uh, not, not to see babies aborted. Um, the, the, the argument that is on the table is which, which is more effective, going directly after Roe v. Wade and trying to overturn Roe v. Wade and, and limiting, limiting uh, abortion legislatively, or um, the argument on the other side, which uh, I'm going to let Nick lay out there, um, and, uh, and then we can kind of discuss it. Um, 
So again, we don't have, let, let, let's avoid what candidates said what. We're talking about results. What leads to less babies being killed? Okay, so go ahead, Nick. I'll give you the floor first. So just, I, um, so I, I posted a thing on Facebook uh, a couple weeks ago, basically, that led to a whole long uh, discussion. But basically, just, um, it was a statistic thing, kind of comparing the number of, of, of abortions kind of over the last 40 years since 1980. And it kind of showed that essentially the main takeaway was there, it's been fairly, the, the trends have been fairly consistent regardless of, of what party is in power nationally and what president is in power. Um, and if anything, there was a slight uptick in abortions when there was a, a Republican president and a slight downtick when there was a Democratic president. And I'm not making any claims that there is necessarily um, you know, uh, a democratic president, um, unilaterally by himself causes abortions to go down. Um, my point was more along the lines of historically speaking for the last four decades, if you are voting either entirely or primarily on the basis of wanting to reduce or eliminate abortions and you were voting for a Republican for president or national office on that basis, that has been a sucker's bet for four decades, basically. It's not worked. It might be this time, maybe this time, if you vote for Donald Trump and you vote for you know, Republican senators and congressmen, maybe this time Roe v. Wade will be outlawed, maybe that'll cause abortions to go down all the way. Um, but that's been kind of the, the promise and the, uh, the rhetoric for, for almost 40 years and um, has, uh, has not played out that way. Um, so the idea that um, in order to, uh, if you want to see abortions go down, you kind of, um, the only option is Republican is, has been put to, put to bed, I think, um, for four straight decades. And, and Nick, just to clarify, um, what, you, what you posted on, on, on Facebook, the, the trends, were there any, claim, were there any claims as to why if it's you know obviously it's not it's not it's not solely who, who's the president, yeah. but what what are the what are the claims as to why it there's a downward trend when there has been a democratic uh, administration? I don't think the article itself made made any like claims that anything was was one hundred percent clear. Um, and I don't make those claims that it's one hundred percent clear. I tend to agree though that um, a, a lot of the aspects of um, you know making. Uh, contraception both more available and more affordable for people, um, uh, general um, economic policies that, uh, you know, provide more opportunity and income for people at the lower level. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said that a lot of abortions happen not um, because people love having abortions, but because they are in bad financial straits and bad situations and that um you know providing uh more benefits more contraception to avoid that in the first place and um you know uh things along those lines uh are, are contributing so this is the chart that that you posted on facebook um tom is going to fact check it and if it's wrong we won't show this part but uh um that's fine. Um, yeah, I don't want assu to... Assuming it's fine, assuming it's right, this is the chart that you posted and that generated a conversation that I saw. I mean, okay, let's go back to just Reagan, Bush, and Bush. What did Reagan, Bush, and Bush do for unborn babies? And I'm talking results, not, not what they said they wanted to do or how much they cared about them or how much they were against abortion. Um, I'm talking about the results. First of all, <clears throat> I don't think a president could do anything. Uh, he could put the Supreme Court justices then who are pro-life, and maybe it's so, so if the, the new one comes in, uh, Comey, uh, what's her name, Comey Bryant? What's her name? Barrett. Barrett. Barrett is her last name. Comey Barrett. So she gets in and say they, but I think the best we could hope for as pro-life people is that it would be, they would do away with Roe versus Wade, but it would go to all the states. So all the, so each state would have its own, whether they would have abortion or not. It's almost the best we could hope for in, in this day and age, because, you know, unless, and I said this earlier, 
and, and I truly believe this, if people actually seen an abortion, if actually they seen a baby being killed in the womb, they, they would be like, no one would be for it. 19 out of 20 people would say, are you kidding me? We can't have this. And <laughs> we wouldn't have, you know. Uh, let, let's assume all of us on here are against it. What, what I'm asking is, how is my vote going to make a difference this election for for in favor of saving unborn babies? That's that's. Uh... Well, okay. The new the new Supreme Court justice gets in, Barrett. So then it's six to three. Now, if and they haven't answered this yet, but but they're they're going to try to stack the court and put a couple more in. Supreme Court judge is going to change the Constitution. They've already wavered that you already know they're going to try to do that. They're going to try to do that, Kamala and Biden. They're going to try, Biden don't know what he's doing, but he'll go along with the left wing on that one. Just for the record, that doesn't change the Constitution. I just want to put that out there. Not, yeah. Well, what do you mean, doesn't we, we have nine Supreme Court justices. And they, not, the not always. The Constitution says you can have as many as you want. Right. All right, so they're going to stack the court. They're going to stack the court. It's to, to, ch to change what we had for what? For, from the beginning of the uh, for 150 but years? Mid-1800s, mid I think we've had nine since yeah, then. So they, they want to change. They, you know, they, they won't answer that because they're afraid to answer that because they're afraid that the polling will show that people don't want that. But you, you know that's what they're going to try to do. So hey, the, the one thing that I, I have a great regard for the Supreme Court of the United States and they themselves, as a body, they rarely overturn existing precedents. Uh, that, that it might be a six to three majority is no guarantee that Roe v. Wade goes away. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, most precedents remain because of the regard, because it's the interpretation of the law um, we're, we're, we're assuming that, that they have a political opinion, and really it's a judicial judgment that they make uh, based on the law. And, and I don't see any guarantee whatsoever that if it was nine to nothing conservatives that they would necessarily overturn um, Roe v. Wade or, or any Supreme Court decision. It's, it's actually pretty rare that the Supreme Court reverses itself. I, I believe. Is that uh, true, Nick? Uh, I, a lot yes. of times, yeah, <laughs> but it's more likely to overturn stuff in the last few years as, it, as it's become more partisan. So, so, so just to clarify then, Pops, for you, from a, from, a, from, the, from a voting standpoint, the only way our vote counts towards babies is if it affects, at this point, if it affects Supreme Court the uh, the Supreme Court. I don't know how else to uh, they're going to go about it. I, mean, okay. I, don't, I don't know, you know. Frank she gets in, and this if this comes up somehow, a case comes up, and she gets in, and they and they but but I still say it will go to the states. Now the states will decide what to do with abortion. So so that's the best I think we could hope for, and 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 you know, that might be okay. We have red states, blue states, so, you know, you're going to have states to go to get abortions and states you can't get an abortion. I don't know. You know? And Nick, what do you think would that, that would do if we just went to red states, blue states? I mean, I'm guessing would... that, I'm guessing that that would probably reduce abortions a little bit, but not that much, just because most of the states that are going to keep abortion extremely open um, and, and very liberal and lots of, uh, in, you know, just kind of the abortion on demand, for lack of a better word, are going to be generally the, the most populous states and the states where more abortions happen anyway. And I honestly, my, my, this is not based on anything, but my, my, what I, my prediction would be that if that happened, there would be a lot of groups that would also raise money and, and, and create non-governmental ways to fund people to travel, you know, across state lines. Because it's not like you have to go to another country. You just have to get on a plane or drive, you know, a couple hours to the next state. And if someone in, you know, Louisiana has to go to, you know, another state, um, they can get a, be given a couple hundred bucks and a driver and there, there you go. So. I think there will be structures to, to keep it going at, at near the same level, regardless. Um, it's just going to be harder and it's going to be a burden, but, um, you know, we'll see how, how, uh, 
how much people are willing to shoulder that burden to, uh, to still have abortions. And um, being a pro-life person, you think that the greatest hope of reducing abortions is that even though, even though most all uh, candidates on the left are pro-choice, that big government, even if that big government is pro-choice, that that big government uh, coming alongside the poor, the marginalized, um, more will lead to a, a, a indirect result of that would, could be potentially less abortions. That, that, that's your, I don't think it's an either or thing. I think the, 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 the best way to reduce abortions, if that's the only thing you care about is to put those, you know, more, uh, you know, put those, uh, those socioeconomic things that basically provide for more, um, you know, healthcare uh, for everyone, more um, uh, uh, contraceptives, all that stuff combined with outlawing Roe v. Wade and outlawing abortion is the best way. Um, but if you have to choose one versus the other, I just don't think it's clear which one is the better one. And that if you're banking, if you're putting all your, all your eggs in the one basket of they're going to nominate a Supreme Court justice, that justice is going to overturn Roe v. Wade and once it's overturned, enough states are going to also put restrictions on it to make it not still super easy to do it. Like I said, that bet has been failing for 40 straight years, whereas, um, you know, the other side, I believe, in my, in my opinion at least, there's a lot to offer that I'm not willing to just uh, concede the fact that, oh, well, even though I agree with X, Y, and Z on the Democratic side, the fact that I don't like abortion means I have to vote Republican. That's kind of all I'm saying. I don't, I don't want to bite off more than I can chew on this issue or, or overstate what I'm trying to say. Okay. Okay. I just, I just wanted to understand the, uh, the, 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 the position, the um, pro-life Democrat or pro-life left, if you will. But just to, to follow up on that, um, basically the premise behind the graphic and Nick, you don't necessarily have to answer this directly, but anybody can. Um, it, it seems as though there may be a conflation of success and intent in that, you know, saying that people who have wanted to do it haven't been successful at doing it um, is a little bit different than saying, you know, people who have no intention of doing it, have, you know, are somehow going to be more successful at achieving that goal. So not voting for one, if you understand what I'm saying, like, if you say that it's been a failure for people to vote Republican because they haven't been successful in achieving restrictions on the number of abortions, con you know, conversely, do you think they're going to be successful in that goal voting for people who have no intention to do it whatsoever? Not necessarily. I just so so. But what I'm saying, are you, are you just basically saying it's a complete lost cause politically? Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying it's a lost to, cause. To even vote on that. I'm saying that the the issue. All I'm saying is that the, the idea that the Republican solution to abortion is not something, it, it's, it's an open question whether it's effective or not, whereas I, most discussions I have are kind of just concede the point that, well, yeah, if you, if you, want, if you, if you don't like abortion, then you're a Republican on that issue, you're conservative on that issue, whereas I'm like, are you really? Because that's not what I see. Now, do you, do you feel as though sort of a, uh, sometimes a man without a country being on the Democratic side uh, based on that issue? You know, people, even the head of the DNC had come out, you know, Tom Perez had come out saying there's no place in the Democratic Party for pro-lifers a couple of years ago. So, I mean, not that, not that everyone has to be excluded, but do you ever feel like you are, like, as I said, a man without a country uh, because of your difference of opinion on that view? I feel like a man without a country in politics, uh, just in, in, in all aspects. I don't, I don't identify with a, with a party. I don't like the idea of parties. I would, I mean, my ideal would be to be independent. Um, the only reason I was registered as a Democrat was just to vote in the presidential election last year. Before that, I was independent. Um, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm probably going to vote for a guy named Brian Carroll, who's part of a, um, he's like a, it's a, basically a, a, a Christian Democrat party kind of thing where it's, um, you know, uh, consistent life ethic from birth to death, basically. So like anti-death penalty, but also anti-abortion um, in favor of, you know, uh, of, of uh, more of a distribution um, uh, model of socioeconomics rather than pure capitalism, healthcare for all, climate environmental protections. 
Um, so I think I'm probably going to vote for him. Um, is that the American Solidarity? It is, yes. I was looking at that. I was looking at that. I was hoping when Trump is president before this pandemic that maybe we'd do away with the Republican and Democrat Party too. And then people would run for president and you'd have to figure out who they are. So no R in front of them and no D in front of them and just two people running and two businessmen, two doctors, two this or whatever. And now you have to find out what they stand for, what they, and, and vote for them. And I think that would be great. I think that would be a dream come true for America. Do you guys think in order to deal with the two party system, I thought so too. I thought Trump was going to kind of be a wrecking ball. Um, and uh, however you, whether you liked him or didn't like him, that, you know, at the very least, it, this whole two party thing would kind of get blown up a little bit. Um, do you think we buy into or enable that two party thing by saying every time, well, I can't vote independent. I can't vote for this American solidarity party. They're not going to win. So I can't, Instead of going, you know what, they're not going to win in 2020, but let's say they get 3% of the vote in 2020, and then 2024, they get 15% of the vote, and then 2028, as people see, oh, this thing is picking up speed, maybe by 2032, there's enough votes in those parties that it does break up the two-party system. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Ross Perot almost did it. He did it. He, he got Bill Clinton in. Ross Perot got Bill Clinton in. He, that's how they beat George Bush, the, the, the senior. Well, and, well. And, 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 yeah. and, the, and the tax thing killed him, man. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah. if Russ, take, take Russ Perot's votes out of there and, 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 and Bush wins easy. So, but I mean, yeah, do you I know, the third party, I don't, yeah. We have a Republican and Democrat party, and uh, right now it's just. There's so much hatred going on in this world, in this country, that I, I don't know if we're going to heal. <laughs> I really don't. Well, I don't. I don't know if that's that's actually politics, though, man. I think that's more of how we get our information. And you know, I, I was reading. I was reading. I, I was watching that uh, that new Netflix. Uh, the social the dilemma. dilemma. Um, you know, and when you talk about how how sixteen. Uh, you know, fake news travels 16 times faster than real yeah. news. I mean, when you see, when you hear that stuff and you understand how information is coming to us, I mean, you know, and you won't get the same news I'm getting because it's going towards what I like more than what news it really is. That's scary. And I think that's why the polarizing is happening. It's not so much the politics. I definitely recommend watching Social Dilemma if y'all haven't. Without a doubt. It. I have worth, it's worth a watch, and they do a segment specifically, on, as Frank was talking about, about the contributions of social media to political polarization and 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 um, social division, mm -hmm. and it's it's one element of it, but it's a but with how highly those are consumed, it's I think a, a big element. So it's it's pretty scary. Mm -hmm. uh, to think of sort of the social engineering that's happening um, from those platforms. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, man. Mm. Well, gentlemen, this was. This was good. Um, and uh, Thank you everyone for your contributions. It was great. Yeah, it was great. It was great, man. Yeah. I say it every time. I, I hope that people can at least go, okay I, can, okay, I can understand that side a little bit more. I can understand that. Um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll look into this American Solidarity uh, you know, party, mm -hmm. see what they're about. Um, maybe learn a few things. Um, Tom, you want to just kind of close us with, with, with prayer for, for Absolutely. Our Lord, I want to I want to thank you, uh, thank you for being our Father, uh, for loving us uh, all, regardless of uh, of opinion, Lord, for 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 being for being our, our loving Father, Lord, and we want to thank you for all these gentlemen who who gave up of their time to come come together, come together and and talk together, Lord, so that we might uh, understand each other better uh, in, in a world where uh, where everyone is so much more divided and and. Uh, there's so much more vitriol, Lord. I thank you that we could come together as Christian men with different opinions, but uh, a common a common focus on on you and our lives, Lord. I pray that you would help anyone listening to this uh, to know that we can see things differently and still focus on you, still love you, uh, and still have the same goals for our world, Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.